O God, make speed to save us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Let us say Psalm 126, alternating by the half verse. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then was our mouth filled with laughter. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for us. Restore our fortunes, O Lord. Those who sowed with tears, those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you, and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Today we celebrate Sarah Josepha Buell Hale, and this is what the church tells us about her. Sarah Josepha Buell was born in New Hampshire in 1788 to Captain Gordon Buell and Martha Buell, both of whom were advocates for equal education for both sexes. In 1813, she married David Hale, a promising lawyer who shared her intellectual interests. In 1822, David died four days before the birth of their fifth child. Sarah Buell Hale wore black for the rest of her life. And to support her family, she turned to her considerable literary skills. In a year, a volume of poetry appeared, followed by a successful novel, Northwood, A Tale of New England, which was among the first American novels by women and one of the first dealing with slavery. The success generated by Northwood enabled her to edit the popular ladies' magazine, which she hoped would aid in educating women, as she wrote, not that they may usurp the situation or encroach upon the prerogatives of man, of man, but that each individual may lend her aid to the intellectual and moral character 
of those within her sphere. In 1830, she published a book of verses for children aimed at the Sunday school market. It included the now famous Mary Had a Little Lamb, originally called Mary's Lamb. Following the examples of her parents, she labored consistently for women's education and helped found Vassar College. Her publications, including the influential Godey's Ladies Book, promoted concern for women's health, property rights, and opportunities for public recognition. Hale's influence was widespread, particularly for middle-class women in matters of child-rearing, morality, literature, and dress. Although the editors of Godey's instructed her to avoid party politics in the publication, she dedicated much energy to causes which could unite North and South across party lines. She worked diligently to preserve Bunker Hill and George Washington's plantation home, Mount Vernon, as American monuments. She is perhaps most famous for the nationalization of the Thanksgiving holiday toward which she worked many years and which finally received presidential sanction under Abraham Lincoln. Her work in both the women's and national spheres was exemplary for its conciliatory nature, its concern for the unity of the nation, and for her desire to honor the work and influence of women in society. Few pieces of scripture return my heart to its center like the Beatitudes. These short, repetitive verses from the gospel we attribute to Matthew are as comforting as they are daring. If we remove them from their context and put them in the mouth of a governor or even the president, we would collectively freak out, especially when it sounds like he's saying there's blessing in suffering and persecution. But in the mouth of Jesus, who we know suffers and turns so much of his attention to those who do suffer and to the provoking of the whole world to attend to those who suffer. A phrase like, blessed are the poor in spirit, is not so shocking. He is not condoning poverty or suffering spirits. It's a countering principle. Blessing doesn't come to the happy. The well-off don't have the market on blessing cornered, even if they can rig all the other markets to their favor. Blessing comes in sadness, mourning, and dis-ease. It comes in worrying about your neighbors and in trying to make the world better. So, in a sense, blessing is more directly connected to bringing others joy than in being joyful. Sarah Buell Hale is a profound example of this principle. She was married for nine years before her husband's death, while she was pregnant, no less. For the rest of her life, another 57 years, she wore black. In our age, in which people feel all too free to say to the grieving, get over it, such sustained mourning is iconic. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Sarah Buell Hale spent the rest of her life writing and advocating for equality in its truest sense, ideas that seem strangely obvious but no less polarizing today. In this way, she is very much the opposite of the late Phyllis Schlafly, lately of the new TV show, who drew consensus around the politics of equality on behalf of a conservative view of traditions 
Hale's vision of equality, tradition, and our common spirit transcended the political interests of a single movement. And yet even this is used as a political cudgel by many, rendering the cause of equality itself as being too political and not transcendent enough. Much like telling those who protested the death of Michael Brown that they aren't sympathetic enough or that the poor that aren't suffering enough to warrant help. These are the sort of responses to discomfort that make equality itself seem like a pipe dream, but it isn't. It is more or less just as given as oppression. There is something both remarkable and utterly normal about a widow make, making a new career. An idea that is now so common, we wonder how revolutionary it could have been and it shocks the modern sensibility to consider Hale such a pioneer in just the last two centuries. Perhaps then we consider the sixth blessing, the one I usually skip over in my own thinking. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. We tend to condemn one another, not only for our actions, but for our motives, or what we believe the other's motives are, even when we don't really have any. Not in that way, anyway. We ignore motives like equality, generosity, peace, and compassion, even when we are motivated by God in those directions. It's easier to dismiss these as being more political than pure. An idea so clearly politically motivated, it screams hypo hypocrisy. Nonetheless, Hale's example is no less pure than the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge or Gandhi's Salt March, movements which put equality, peace, and justice at the center these are the only true avenues of peace we have. And the promise itself is that through pure heartedness, we will see God. The seventh blessing may be the hardest. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. For as much as we want peace, we don't so much like the idea of making it. It is hard, anyway, but it isn't so much about the idea that it's hard, it's why. We know that the inevitable response to the making of peace is violence in support of oppression, a fact we too often attribute to flip sides of a coin. Peace to war, war to peace. But making peace is not the other side. The other side of the coin from war is more war. For the political opposite of one party rule is another party's rule. Peace, however, is an interruption to war. It is the delegitimizing of that coin flip. It is the presentation to the whole world saying, our way of being today is unjust and lacks the very notion of peace. There can be no purity this way. Well, it is certainly disruption that Hale sought. It was also a kind of obvious reallocation of political power, not to the other side or to flip the dynamic to its opposite conclusion, but to correct its impurity to bring just relations between people, offer new hope where none was possible. The kind of new peace we take for granted, and yet many continue to make space for. An equality in leadership that is so evidentiary, it must be manifest universally. 
and seeking that is so revolutionary we struggle to frame it. We foolishly toss it into a politics bin so full of common sense dualisms we hardly consider what we're even thinking. But this, a politics of peace, justice, human dignity, is so uncharacteristic of dual thinking, we hardly understand it. And sometimes we do understand, and we all work to make peace. May those times be ever greater and much more frequent. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, now and forever. Amen. In the season of resurrection, we are invited to find the renewed presence of Christ in our surroundings. Therefore, let us pray. Open our eyes. We hope to see. We know that we are the church, O God. Your presence is not restricted to a building, but is present with us in our homes. Help us to see the ways your holy church is continuing throughout the world, even as we struggle to remember it. Open our eyes. We know that we are mortals, O God. You know our hearts, our love, and our hatred, our divisions, and our borders. Help this, our common family, by territory. These are leaders through election, and all our common needs. Help us see beyond our walls and provincial thoughts to recognize our presence in every place. Open our eyes. We know that all of this is your creation, O God, and yet we take your blessing and grace for granted. Help us to love one another and all that is in your heart as if it were our own desire. Open our eyes. We know the joy of community, O God. You give us compassion and order, the very means of connection and capacity for building a common life. Bring our awareness to your vision of community that transcends boundaries and any sense of isolation. Open our eyes. We know we are weak, O God. You know the injustice we tolerate or endure, the anger we exercise or receive, the forces of evil that encourage poverty and violence. We remember the imprisoned, the immigrant, and the isolated, remembering especially those who are choked by the coronavirus, those who treat them or pray for them, and all those suffering the anxiety this virus brings into our lives. Be with all who suffer. Open our eyes. We trust you, O God. 
You revealed your truest self in Jesus and invited us to see in him the breadth of life and the agony of death without allowing that to be the story you hoped to tell. We trust in you and so entrust our dead to you. As Jesus invited Mary and Martha at the grave of Lazarus saying, unbind him and let him go. May we also unbind our dead and let them go. Open our eyes. Let us take a moment to include any petitions we may have. Blessed are you, God of life, who raised his son from the dead into new life. Receive the prayers we offer this day and grant that we may see your holiness in the world around us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.